Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. How do you respond to today's spiritual skepticism? You know what I mean, that if you go out and you talk anything about your Christian worldview, you are probably shunned and hated for doing so. You are probably ridiculed as being an idiot. Someone who is so foolish to believe in the words of what? The Bible? That book that was written and changed so many times in the last thousands of years? How could you even begin to think that something true for us today could have been started so long ago? How do you respond to that? How do you respond to the moral, let's call it bullying, that goes on in our sphere where you are quickly labeled as someone who is a hater, who is a despiser, who is someone who doesn't really care how people feel and want them to be happy. How do you respond to that? There are a lot of boundaries and walls, and these are just two examples. You have different prejudices and worldviews, and you have a public school system that is very against what you stand for as a Christian. How do you cut through all of that when you want to simply tell someone about the person that you love more than anyone else? Jesus. You can say things like, Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. I love Him because He has taken my sins away. He is God Himself and He has died for me. And that gives me hope beyond the daily grind. You can say that, and it's a great, great testament to your faith. You may say that, just simply, look around, this world is broken, and I hate what I see around me, but I'm thankful that Jesus gives me that ray of light and hope that this world will be fixed, it'll be remade, and that the sins that so plague me and all of my problems... He has taken away and He has forgiven me. You can give people that beautiful testimony to your faith. And you may get frustrated when their response is, Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? The Bible? Are you kidding me? Can anything true come from that ancient and foolish and bigoted book serious? How do you respond to that? Our text gives us a pretty simple and beautiful plan of doing just that. It's a very simple strategy that I hope that you take from our sermon and our service today and you make use of it right away as you speak to your family, your friends, and those who challenge you and even hate you for the worldview that you have come to love and hold so dear. What does our text say? Actually, just before our text, Jesus begins to call his disciples. The first two are Andrew and Peter, and Andrew's friend. What does he say, Jesus, to Andrew to make him leave everything and follow him? He simply says, follow me. And Andrew had been listening to John. And John had been saying, hey, there's a guy coming after me who I am not worthy to untie his shoes. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then Jesus came and he said, there he is. That's the guy that I've been preaching about. That is the Messiah. And Andrew and the other disciple followed him and, and asked Jesus, where are you going tonight? And he said, why do you want to know? He said, because we'd like to follow you. And they did. And they heard Jesus speak. And Andrew couldn't help it. He ran to his brother Peter, Simon, 
and said, Simon, you got to come. you got to hear this guy. And he says, come and see. And Peter comes. He brings Peter to Jesus. And they never left. Until they died for him. And then we have our text today where Jesus goes, he's getting ready to move to Galilee and he sees this man named Philip, which our text tells us is also from Bethsaida, the same place as Andrew and Peter. And he simply says to Philip, follow me. And maybe the reason the text tells us that he's from the same town is just picture it. You have Jesus and now he has Andrew, Peter and one other disciple following behind him and he sees Andrew and Peter, who he grew up with. And he's thinking, well, I don't know why he's telling me to follow him, but Andrew and Peter are there, so there's, there's got to be something cool going on. But again, Philip, in so quick of a time, he's there following with them. He hears Jesus speaks, and he's compelled to run and tell his friend Nathaniel, What? We have found the one who Moses talked about in the prophets. All of the scriptures that we grew up with. You know that legend about this one who is going to come and save the people from their sins and and redeem Israel, be that everlasting king. I found him. Now just think if your friend came to you and said that a legend that you have heard about, think of any fairy tale, or something that you've heard about in your, in your stories as children, that, yeah, I was walking with him today out in the country. Really? That by itself would make you at least skeptical. You'd want to see some proof. But then on top of that, he says that he's from Nazareth, which Nazareth was, was a known nothing town. It was smaller than Navarino. It was a tiny little country town, and it had a, probably a much more derogatory reputation than Navarino. I don't mean to criticize if any of you are from Navarino. <laughs> but Nazareth didn't have a good reputation. It was in the middle of nowhere. It was country, bumpkin place. And Nathaniel's like, okay, first off, you're telling me that you met the legend, the chosen one. Right? That for thousands of years we've been waiting for. But now he's here? And he's from Nazareth? You've got to be kidding me. Nathaniel has prejudice. He has skepticism. He has all of the things that you expect when you tell someone about Jesus today. Things haven't changed that much. And what? How does Philip respond? to Nathaniel's objections. Nazareth, are you kidding me? He simply says, come and see. And he does. And what does Nathaniel see? As he's coming, Jesus, almost knowing, he does know, knowing that he has this prejudice mentality coming in, he says to him, look, here is a true Israelite with no deceit. Here is an ideal, and he's got the right accent. He comes from a, a good place, Bethsaida. This is like the, the local hot spot. Look, here he is. And Nathaniel responds, do I know you? How do you know me? You don't know me. And then Jesus responds with that miraculous phrase, I saw you under the fig tree before you even were called. And he's amazed. And Jesus responds, You just wait. Just wait. And then he says such a beautiful prophecy directly to the Old Testament. He says, you will see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Do you remember where that came from? That's from Jacob's dream. When he was running away from home because he he lied to his father, put that goat skin on his hand so he could get the blessing... And he had to run away because his brother wanted to kill him. And God appeared to him and showed him a vision of angels going up and down to heaven. To remind him of his promises, of his love. And give him something that maybe he didn't even fully understand. But he knew that the Lord was with him. 
And then Jesus says, this is what you're going to see. Whoa. This man speaks with authority. This Jesus is not like anyone else I have ever met. This Jesus says, you will see far greater things than these. How does God want you to break through those walls? Simply tell them to come and see. Each and every one of us is called by the gospel to believe. In the words of the Bible, God promises is not like an ordinary book. These are not ordinary words. These are the words of God. And today, when we read the word of the Lord, God is working in our hearts. He is revealing to us His glory. His glory in Jesus, His glory from the beginning, the glory that you will experience as believers in Jesus Christ who paid for your sins. He died on a cross, not just a man, but God as well, who died for you so that you could have the hope of eternal life. You could have the hope of being remade in the image of God, the image that was lost at the beginning of time. That is the glory that God is revealing to you in the words of God. That is why you believe. Not because of some clever argument. Not because you were scientifically proven by facts to believe in God. But because the Holy Spirit has worked faith in your heart so that you believe and you have begun to see the glory of God. And you will see much greater things than these. So God says to you, to all of us who have been called by that gospel that you are to tell your friends and relatives with the same excitement that Andrew and Philip ran to tell their brother and their friend. And when they respond, Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? The Bible? Are you kidding me? Can we still find truth there? Respond. Come and see. Come to worship with me. Hear the words of God with me. Just listen. You know that I am not a, a crazy person. You know that I'm a reasonable individual. You know me. You have grown up with me or I have known you for a good amount of time. You know that I'm not insane. I'm asking you simply to come and see. Come and see the reason I have the hope that I have. That I believe in a man who lived 2,000 years ago. And I believe that I will live after I die. I know it. Because I've seen it? No. But because I've heard it. And the Word of God has painted such a beautiful picture for me. And I love it. And I love Him. Come and see. Just come with me to church. Come with me to the coffee shop and let's open the Word of God to the first chapter of John and let's just read. It's because of these words that I believe. Come and see. That's it. Our strategy for today, for all of us Christians who are here, we are called by the gospel to believe it and to share it. And Jesus says you don't have to be afraid that you don't know what to say, you don't know how to answer the spiritual skepticism of explaining how the Bible isn't just any book, that it was written by men who were killed by the Holy Spirit. Now how does that work? God gave them the words directly. How do we know that the Bible is true? Well, you can tell them all the evidence of thousands and thousands of manuscripts of the Bible being identical through thousands of years. The Bible is more attested than any book in the world by far. And yet we read the Greek books of Homer and the Iliad, and we say this is what they wrote, but we have one copy. In the Bible, we have thousands and thousands. You can tell them about all of that, but that will not give them faith. And even if you don't know it or feel comfortable doing it, it doesn't matter. Simply say, come and see. Because you don't believe because of these Proofs you believe because the Holy Spirit has worked in your heart the faith to have new life in Him so that you cling 
to God himself, that you believe that there is hope in this broken world, that you know you are forgiven, and that you have life everlasting waiting for you. That comes from the word of God, because God promises to give you faith through it. Let us go out as fishermen, as ordinary individuals, fulfill the calling that God has given each of us, and that is to tell others to be fishers of men, to simply say, come and see. And you, and I, and they will see far greater things than I saw you under the fig tree. We will see the ladder to heaven. We, with the angels, will praise God forever and ever before his throne. This is the one who Moses spoke about. This is the one the prophets revealed. This is your God who became a man to save you. Amen. Please rise.